Um, and we've got three amazing guests joining us. Uh, my first guest today is Paul Firth, who is the founder and managing director of ICAS Mina, who's been here in the region for many years, helping employees, employers lean into the well-being of their workforces. Paul, welcome to the panel. Thank you very much, Scott. It's 12 years, actually, just to be exact. Uh, perfect. Um, my second guest is Robin Weninger, who is the Managing Director of the Global Institute of Leadership and Technology, GILT. Robin, welcome to the panel. Right, thanks, Scott. Glad to be here. I, I can see you into tech because you've got much better gear than I have. Very Mohammed, are you there? Join us. Okay, maybe some technical technological problems there. Oh no, here he comes. Mo, how are you? Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Lovely to be with you guys. So let's start with employee engagement. Uh, and I think it's a really kind of interesting time to be having this conversation. We saw very recently that the Cigna uh, 360 Wellbeing Survey came out uh, and looked very clearly at the UEE. Um, and some of their top findings were, okay, last year, 50% of respondents said they were going to quit their job. Of that 50%, 80% did. This year, that number's up 55%. UEE leading the way in terms of um, wanting to leave their job for something which is either more engaging or more purposeful and even willing to take less salary to have a job that fits their life circumstances or goals better. And also combined with that, we've also got some of the highest levels of stress and burnout going. And on the flip side, we've got a report out today that said employers are not going to pay pay rises this year until next year. So employment engagement. Paul, I'm going to start with you because you were the first person we uh, we introduced. Interesting times for employee engagement. And the companies actually know what employee engagement should be because it almost seems like sometimes it's tick boxes rather than genuine culture. Exactly. Um, I mean, for me, the, the word engagement is, is a bit like well-being, if you ask 10 people, what's their perception, understanding of well-being, you probably get 10 different answers. Same with engagement, employee engagement, you know, what does it actually mean? Um, you know, and, and unfortunately, or fortunately, there are depth varying views as, as to what people perceive as being employee engagement. Therefore, it makes it quite difficult then in terms of you know, what is it we're actually trying to focus on, you know, in terms of making a change and how we're going to actually, you know, sort of monitor that. We have to have a clear understanding of what we mean by engagement. Uh, and I think the Cigna survey, I mean, it's, very, it's quite, it's quite eye-opening eye in terms of, you know, you mentioned about the sort of um, the, 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 the culture of people now looking and, and physically leaving their jobs um, yeah. and saying that they're happy to look for another job at a lower, lower level of pay. Um, you know, the other thing in the Cigna survey was that, you know, we. The UAE has one of the higher, highest levels in the world of overall well-being. So you would think everything's perfect. Um, but then counter to that, as you say, we've got the highest stress levels in the world. So something is not quite, or something is missing in terms of, well, so then, you know, why are employees leaving and looking for something different? And what is it they're looking for? I've got my own theories. Got my own theories on that one. I've got my own experiences on that one as well. Um, Robin, um, and, I, and I, I, when I was looking at the work you do, I mean, you're often citing from Greek philosophy. Um, so I'm really wondering what the ancient Greek philosophers can teach us about modern day engagement. But, you know, it's interesting, like you're younger and, and more handsome than me, or maybe not Paul, but um, what's, what's your generational view on 
where we're going to in terms of employee engagement because it's it, it's changing. Like men, when me and Paul came into the workforce, nobody gave a damn about employee engagement. It was too busy. You were told. Well, I, I'm happy that um, my facial treatment seemed to work um, and I'm <laughs> younger here. That's that's very good uh, first opening. So thank you so much, uh, Scott, for this uh, uh, lovely framing here. Um, no, I think what Paul just said um, ref or is like really nailing it, right? Uh, we have so many uh, different concepts that need definition. And our title here for this panel uh, has four words and three of them need definition and some we are not even sure if it's one word or two. Um, we yeah. need to really think about, first of all, what is employment at all right now, right? We see a, a massive shift in how employment is being perceived. We're seeing more project work being done. We see more decentralized teams emerging. Um, just look at it, pre-pandemic, we had quite often this idea of that a team is in one spot, right? Geographically speaking, yeah. that we are collaborating, that we have our daily standups in the coffee corner uh, of the office. Uh, now we see, hey, for some reason it also works if someone is sitting uh, in, I don't know, uh, in Australia, another one is sitting in Singapore, next one in the UAE, another one in Germany, and another one in uh, Latin America, the US, whatever. And all of a sudden you have a project that is basically running 24 seven with a massive, um, massive uh, shift in, first of all, how we work, um, what we can achieve in much shorter times, right? I mean, just thinking back at the times where we said, like, okay, one day is eight hours. Now, when you have a decentralized team, one day is actually one day, right? Meaning 24 hours uh, capability of, of having the, the machine running, uh, which first of all, ask what is employment, right? How, how does it work? How do we also uh, connect with these people? How does it translate also into social measures? And then engagement and, and satisfaction, um, is this the same? Works one without the other? Is it co two completely different things? What is being driven by organizations? What is driven by the individuals? Um, because I think what we need to also appreciate here is in this discussion that the individual is a little bit self-responsible as well uh, to achieve both factors, but organizations are even more responsible to framing the environment that the individual can actually, um, yeah, come to a point where they are engaged and satisfied, right? And I think this is like a really interesting task with all these changes that we're having now. And I think it's a beautiful task because we are unlocking completely new potentials, not only in humans, but also in talent and the way we might work in the future. So I think it's a really broad question, um, which is in, is in fact philosophical, right? <laughs> And we've got 10 minutes to answer it. Um, Mo, I'm going to bring you in here, if, if I might. Um, it'd be interesting to get, you know, you're a motivational speaker. Um, and when we think about engagement and engaged employees, I mean, I find the, the TikTok trend of quiet quitting, you know, and that, that label is, is, is almost, I, I, I think, inaccurate. But it, I think it's interesting from an employer <laughs> perspective that we define just doing your job to the expected level as quiet quitting. So That's true. Where, where are we kind of at with that? You know, where do you approach engagement and, and creating engagement as a motivational speaker? Yesterday I was in the meeting with one of the customers. It was a very interesting meeting. And I told him he was refusing, it's a tech company, and he was refusing to give a kind of employee engagement with a high level. And I told him, look, very simple, I can say, statement that's saying that if you cook something and it's permanent, you're going to eat happy and you will de defend everyone. Oh, the cake is amazing. So why are you doing that? Because we cooked it together in the home, for example, or anywhere. So we believe that we did an effort on it. Maybe the result is not amazing, but at the end of the day, that the people believe if they're engaged. This was my answer to him, was he was refusing, refusing the idea. So once you engage the employee, you are making a great job by having a lot of, I can say, revoking a lot of obstacles and the challenges within the organization itself, because at the end of the day, we decide that, not we, not me, or my team. So, Paul, I think, making a very important point, and you as well, that related to that this is need to be real. 
One of the most important killing I'm talking about in most of my speakers and even my business as a consultant to Rickard operation, that we can't make a, a fake environment by just making an environment nice and providing them. This is a very old school of doing business, especially if you're talking about Generation Z. Generation Z in doing business, they're very real and they're very close to the life. So if you're trying to fake it, it will never be real with them. So they will maybe accept it for a very short term and they will leave you in that. So such type of, of concept actually confirmed by organizations like, such like a glass door recently, they have a different research. And the, the very imp important and interesting point about the research, they make a link between the employee engagement internally and the customer satisfaction externally. So if your customer believes that you are doing a real engagement internally, that it will reflect externally. So they believe that you are treating your employees right and you're engaging them. The, actually, the topic overall, it's related to the culture. The culture itself, if it's fit for that, and I don't need to repeat, for example, Zabo's story for Tony Hack long time back and how they did amazing uh, business by doing that. But this is actually the core of the topic itself. If we, if we focus on such type of, uh, I can say, process and mindset and the customize, and this is very important uh, word uh, that, that the, 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 the engagement needs to be customized and focused in, uh, in each organization. We can't do what your company is doing or Paul or open company. It needs to be something fitting our culture and matching with what our employee expect because I can't replicate something going, for example, in Germany or in Canada. Exactly. The framework and the value is the same, but the way doing it, it should be different from organization to another. So, Paul, um, Mo's there has kind of outlined both the benefits and the risks of sort of being either real or fake in that one. I'd, let's start with the, the sort of the negative aspect of this. And perhaps this is something that I think employees really need to wake up to in, in the same way that, you know, sometimes if you're dealing with a sales force, the worst thing you can do is offer a bonus and never pay it. Uh, is it yeah. the same sort of principle in, you know, it's pointless talking a good game on culture because actually then you, you, you yourself are hiding from the truth with inside your company because you're telling yourself you have all these tick boxes. But if none of that's impacting the actual culture, <clears throat> aren't you going backwards and you just don't know it? Absolutely. You can't talk the culture, in my view. Yeah, culture is what people feel. Um, so you, you you can say your culture is you know, supportive and positive and whatever phrase you want to use. Um, but you know your employees will experience what they experience within the organization, regardless of what you say. You know, I've always said that those that tend to talk most about how, what a wonderful culture and place it is to work, generally, you know, it's the quiet ones that have the right culture. They don't need to say anything. Um, and that comes from the top down. Yeah. It stems right from the man at the top or lady at the top, right the way through the organization. And so for me, it's, it's forget words, what you want to describe. Um, you know, if you get the right culture within the organization, that's how you'll get the buying. I mean, I hate the phrase silent quitting. You know, quite the quitting, fact is, yeah. so, Sorry, yeah, quite quitting, yeah. whatever. You know, the reality is, you know, in any business, you will you will have a significant number of your employee population that are there and, you know, they're putting the effort that gets the job done. Yeah. You, know, you have to have yeah. people like that. What you're looking to do is, is try and, you know, try and provide the environment that helps people to, to go above and beyond just doing the job. You know, and th that's where you get in the engagement. I mean, I think that's one of the things that drives me uh, a bit mad about quiet quitting. And Robin, I'll, t I'll take your view on this. In the, it's almost, and I've seen this in the UK with train companies where they, they get so used to above and beyond that they've almost like normalised that above and beyond is part of the pay scale rather than you know, rather than being literally above and beyond. Um, so, and that kind of marries back to having a highly engaged workforce that that our employees or, or companies 
uh, uh, taking the Michael, as we would say back in the UK. <laughs> it's almost a mockery of that job description in the first place. I could say it a bit more bluntly than that, but I won't. The whole concept that companies are taking advantage of above and beyond, and that's actually now almost like coming home to roost and punish them, and perhaps they should be punished for that. What's your thoughts around that space? Yeah, um, I mean, this is uh, now the, the box that we opened that we can't close anymore, right? Now we have another 500 topics on the table. Um, <laughs> I think it's a really interesting aspect that you mentioned there, um, nevertheless, because I think when we look at performance culture, right, in, in general, um, this brought us here, but it probably won't bring us to, to what we're looking next, right? I think we are in a phase where we fundamentally need to rethink organizational structures. I mean, this employment part was one part of that, but it's also the way how do we actually build structures. Um, the way we have built organizations up until this point was that we haven't found any better solution of doing that, mainly due to the lack of technological possibilities, right? We, we needed to have departments that structured in a way we need to have some kind of uh, regulatory environment that we can operate in. But with more and more technologies that are emerging right now, with better data modules, right? With blockchains, with uh, AI and quantum computing that are on the forefront to enable us to transfer a lot of those typical management tasks, technology-driven, almost fully automated, will bring fundamental change into the design of the organization, which brings us back to the question of what is actually leadership? And I think like all of those topics we are mentioning here are fundamental leadership topics. The problem with leadership that we have is uh, that the majority of leaders out there never got educated as leaders because it's just something that people expect you that you can, can do that. Right. We just said, like, hey, you did a great job with, I don't know, selling cars. Now you are the yep. leader of the sales department. Good luck. <laughs> uh, and then we send people to a three days empathy workshop and a four day uh, how to set goals workshop. And then we say, like, now you're a leader. Go, go out, get luck, uh, be lucky. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think this this um, perception, this expectation of you, you do a job great. You get promoted to being a manager, a leader, whatever the name is. Um, you, you know how to do that is really, really dangerous. And I think the art of promoting needs also some kind kind of a change, right? We need to really have this um, this mindset there as well of learning, right? To nurturing a culture, Paul just said it. Uh, you can't just talk about it and have fancy PowerPoint presentations and your annual summit where you have like a great agency that puts it into fancy fonts and nice visuals. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm a little bit cynical about that, right? Because I want to be cynical about that. Um, but like really bringing this and saying, like, hey, instead of putting $150 million into cultural development in terms of marketing, uh, let's just send our, our leaders to a good um, training, let them uh, experience how leadership could work, let them experience how technologies can work, right? Empower them to try something out, to be more courageous in their decisions, to be bolder, to be vulnerable, uh, like all these attributes, right? Send them there and culture will, will be working out much, much better. Uh, and this is not a call not to have a party every now and then, right? But I think you need to really look at the leadership first um, and nurture that from, uh, from within the organization. Uh, be as cynical as you like. I, in my 33 years, I've worked for plenty of leaders who I thought robots had more emotional range, shall we say. Uh, but Mo, this is, I mean, it's really important though, isn't it? Like, we have got leaders now in positions who are never, like, particularly if you think about the Gen Xers who were, you know, like me, they were never taught how to lead people. You know, they were, they, as I say, they were good at selling cars or they were good at writing stories perhaps or they were good at any kind of aspect of their job but they were never given any tools and now all of a sudden you've got McKinsey and EY and PwC and every single research house <laughs> include and also we we heard it from Abby early from Taji as well but all the skills that we need to be successful leaders moving forward is emotional intelligence and the ability to inspire people and we've got people in you know in leadership positions are going ah no i don't know how to do that i'm not equipped so but if they if if they're not equipped how do we equip them how do we create employee engagement if the leaders are not engaged i, I remember I, I read the book in the past i think for Stephen Covey, I, it's it's war for talent so <clears throat> i think we are agree that we have a very big challenge in the world with, with finding and, and developing talent itself. 
The point here, because, you know, part of the hats I wear, it's kind of consulting job. So we face this in a lot of organizations. So as Paul mentioned, and Robin for sure, as on it, on the talent, it comes from up and down. So if if you, if you if we have an imaginary scenario that one of the organization, you have a CEO believing in this, but you don't have a leader in the organization can support you in that. So the tool that we are trying to do because we can't change them all because all of them can sell car, as you mentioned, in a very good way. At the same time, that putting a kind of process and system on, play, uh, on place and different value perspectives inside the organization that even if you are not a leader, I can't make you a leader in a couple of days, but at the same time, you should follow a certain policy. Open door policy is in. If we are deciding where we are going to have in dinner with the team, it's not your call, my friend, it's the team. And if you're not doing that, that means there's a question mark about your, I can say, capabilities as a leader leading the team. So putting such type of, uh, of systems or process on play is very important. And at the same time, technology and uh, artificial intelligence all is a very hot topic. But at the end of the day, it needs to be managed in engaging employees in a smart way. I remember I was in like six months back in, in a meeting with one of the biggest uh, FMCG companies and uh, they have people in the stores all the time. And their idea is that we need those people to go digital. I told them, guys, it's, it's a very good idea. But if we are doing that, like that, it will not work. It's not just shifting them. They, they need the time to do that. Otherwise, you, we will, you will face a problem with your customer because your employee is very upset because he can't submit on leave. So he is in the store because he just don't know. So such type of tools in using technology is smart. It's not for sure all of us believing that technology is going to lead and leading the world. No, blockchain, artificial intelligence, all that. This is not the question. The question is how we are going to apply this within the organization to make an impact. So such type of consideration sometimes leaders forget and just move forward on it. Having a system or process in place and the clear code of conduct and different activities on place, I think it make impact for organization. If we don't have now leaders and we can't change them because this is the most challenging part of the most organic. They are selling my product, they are doing great, they are 20 years with us. So you are not coming from outside, you just tell me, get rid of them. So it's a, this is actually one of the solutions to solve this. Yeah. Thanks, Mo. I always get nervous when we talk about AI because many people would argue that most of my intelligence is artificial. Um, Paul, I'm going to tag in um, the audience here. Uh, they're, they've been firing questions at it. They, 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 they clearly like what you guys have got to say. Uh, Dana Hafid is asked, how do you define engagement? There's an easy one for you. Is it EQ or IQ or maybe a bit of both? I think she may have answered her own question there. But what's your view on this aspect? Uh, <clears throat> a difficult one to answer that one in terms of back to what I was saying right at the beginning. Uh, yeah, it's EQ, it's IQ, it's EI. Um, it's it's going to be a mix of things. You know, at the end of the day, what we're talking about now with with the you know employees are reevaluating their priorities. Yeah, and obviously we said right at the beginning yeah. they're making decisions based on what they want, what they their priorities are. And it may not sit entirely with you know the work requirement. Um, mm -hmm. So we, you know, we're gonna to have to really, for me, it's really around getting flexibility. And I, I mentioned EI, but it's around the leaders, the managers, you know, being able to engage on a one-to-one -one with, with all their teams. Because you're gonna to have to do approach things in slightly different ways. Yes, you're going to have an overarching company structure uh, and process, um, but within that, you're going to have to have allow some flexibility. You're going to have to allow managers to manage. Yeah. Um, okay. So Robin, I want to ask you a question. Um, as the philosopher on the panel, you were, you actually said um, earlier about you know what does work even mean? What is work even these days? Um, and for the millennials and for the Gen Zs, you know. Um, it's almost become a bit of a Ponzi scheme, hasn't it? You know, um, in in the you know back in my day, we our loyalty was to the company. 
because we thought the company was loyal to us. That demographics now change where particularly millennials and Gen Zs, and we can see from that Signa research, are willing to go and look for another job. They're not married to it. So actually employment is almost like a convergence of two parallel paths, which is almost a collaboration rather than an employment until uh, they decide to leave the company. And that presents the challenge to employers to try and keep talent. Yeah. Um. Yes, uh, is the answer in short. Um, uh, I think what we need to uh, appreciate here as well is um, nowadays the, the world is basically the playground, right? Um, if you have the privilege of uh, being well educated uh, and uh, in demand from, from your skill set, right? It doesn't uh, apply necessarily to everybody, which is a shame uh, on, on another uh, spectrum. But if you are young, <laughs> well trained, well educated, uh, speak English, um, then quite a lot of places on this world are, are quite happy um, uh, to to have you, right? And also, like when we look into, for example, technology developments, right, which I think is a really important factor to look at, they're not happening necessarily only in like one university or two or three elites, right? We have like global communities that are basically self-organizing themselves and where it's where it's easy to participate, right? And I think like one of those those really interesting aspects here to say is many, many organizations are still operating on an organizational design or a business model that was developed basically after World War II, which yeah. brought us quite far. I mean, if we look at the overall wealth creation on this planet, even though it's not really equally distributed, we got quite far over the last years. Um, but what got us here won't get us to the next phase, right? Now we're looking yeah. into way more uh, different uh, facades to that. And um, I think you can't say like, there's like one th style of doing it, right? What keeps you in one company might not keep you in another company because maybe you are accepting the worst working conditions, whatever, right? Because you can work for a company that you feel so associated with, right? Uh, probably you want to work for a brand that uh, has a vision or a mission that you connect with, uh, even though knowing that you probably could earn double or even triple the money working for, for another company. I think there's so much different facades to that, which I think is so important then for an organization to say like, what are we actually as an organization, right? What do we want to offer? Do we want to yeah. be a great employee in terms of conditions? Or are we just an amazing brand that everybody wants to work with, right? Do we give people freedom or not? There's there's a lot of people out there that want to have freedom at work, that want to try out, that want to experiment. But there's equally many people out there that don't want to have this freedom, right? They want to say like, hey, I show up at eight, tell me what to do and I leave at five. Yeah. Yeah. Both is totally fine, right? There, There's nothing bad about these different kind of uh, aspects. But I think we need to appreciate this more, right? We need to come back more to a human discussion because ultimately we're, we're talking with humans. We're working with humans and we're interacting with humans. It would be quite cool if we could also treat everybody as a human and uh, not as <laughs> a cultural piece nice? in the equation, yeah. right? Uh, thank you. One of the things about having a philosopher on the uh, is that you open the box and you can carry on this conversation <laughs> forever, really. Uh, we're really enjoying the conversation. <laughs> Mo, I'm going to give you um, Steve Allegan has been dialing in and has been very patient asking questions. Uh, one question he asked was according to their own data, 85% of people are disengaged. So why isn't engaging improving? If we're measuring the right things, are we measuring the right things? You, you know, this percentage is somehow confirmed by different consultants, so I can't, uh, I can't disagree, to be very frank and open. Uh, for different reasons, we can say it. It's, it's, again, it's about finding a leader in the world to manage the change within the organization. So, economic crisis and the tough target for most of the CEOs because at the end of the day, if you look to the CEO, KBI is who is the guy who is managing any company in the world and he's, even if he's the owner, so the money is making very uh, important back. So there's a lot of reasons now, but and it's a fact, but our objective is to look actually into the solution. And just to, to give a last statement from my side, there was a very nice, actually, uh, I can say, analysis and report by Gartner saying that if you implement a kind of love, and they're calling it like that, 
within the way you are doing business, you can feel how the people engage with your organization and then how, how they interact. Very easy for anyone to go inside any organization and spend two hours within the employees or the store. And you can say those guys, even the retail, you can see it in easy. Those people are engaged together and with the management or not. So it's very easy, even without researches, you can feel that your organization is highly engaged or they are just faking it or they are totally dis engaged yeah uh gentlemen i'm going to rob from my closing remarks to give you a little bit of extra time sorry uh informer paul can you give me your top tip or top two tips for companies getting into engagement i know we just the time site it's not fair but i just top two top two um uh when you're deciding that you're going to implement a an engagement and well-being uh initiative um take a step back make sure you have a very clear strategic plan of what it is what you're going to do and how you're going to measure it you know part of what steve was saying in his question you know it's fine doing the research you know, you'll get an answer what are you going to do about it so make sure you have a very clear strategy and plan ahead um and the one thing i probably would say is um Every time we get these surveys, we say it's a wake-up call. We keep saying it's a wake-up call. It's like the like alarm up? going off in the morning and we click it off and we go back to sleep again. You know, wake yeah. up. Um, so my, my last comment would be, view this as managing risk and liability within your business. Because that's what I'm we're doing. I'm going to give the last word to the philosopher. In 60 <laughs> seconds, Robin. Have you ever answered a question in 60 seconds? I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll try. What's your, again, your advice when you look at it with, you know, with your guilt head, when you go into companies, um, engagement, what's your top tips for the audience leaning into the, the conversation? Yeah, uh, it's a beautiful question um, that is actually easy to answer. I think nurture curiosity. Um, because we don't know what will be next. We have no idea uh, what will bring us to the next phase. We have no idea how this is going to uh, play out. So nurture curiosity, uh, invite people to ask challenging questions. Uh, don't listen to the naysayers. Um, be curious, be challenging, seek plausibility, and then uh, figure out what's next um, because nobody has the answer what's next. That feels very much to me like a mic drop moment. Um, gentlemen, Absolutely. thank you so much for your thoughts on this, pal. I'm sorry to wrap it up so quickly. I carry on the conversation for ages. But Paul, Robin and Mo, thank you so much for joining the panel. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. Oh, enjoy.